classical mechanics, Lagrangian mechanics, that's what we're doing, and we've done a bunch of Lagrangian problems. Remember that Lagrangian problems uh, are suitable in the cases where we have some type of constraint, some way that the motion can't do anything else, a block on a plane, a, a mass on, swinging on a string, something like that. And it's great. But what if we want to find the force of constraint? Well, then we need a new method. Okay, and I'm gonna go over that method using this problem right here. This is a half at was machine. But what is useful is to first solve it with Newtonian mechanics and then do it with Lagrangian mechanics so we know exactly what the solution is. We know how what's going on. We know what we're gonna get. And then when we use it for more complicated situations, we don't have to worry about doing the Newtonian way. But this is a simple problem. You can do it either way. So I have a mass M1 on a frictionless plane connected to a mass M2 hanging over the, the, over the edge. And I let it go and I want to find the motion. Okay, so let's just go ahead and draw force diagrams for both of these things. So for mass one, I have uh, the gravitational force pulling down, M1G. I have the normal force, N. And then I have the tension in the string, T, just like that. For mass two over here, I have the gravitational force, M2G and then I have the tension pulling up. Now, I have a string, and so strings, there's two important things with the string. One, the magnitude of the tension is the same for both of these objects, because it's the same string. Number two, the magnitude of the acceleration is the same for both objects, because if this moves a little bit that way, that has to move a little bit that way, and so they have to move the same amount, so the rates of change and the second rate of change, the acceleration would have to be the same. Okay, so if I look at just mass one, I can write down Newton's second law. In the y direction, there's nothing going on, right? Because it's obviously not accelerating in the y direction. In the x direction, I'm going to say F net in the x direction is the mass times acceleration. And that's going to be equal to the tension, right? So the tension's the force in the x direction, and that's mass times acceleration. That's pretty straightforward. And over here, the one thing I'm going to do differently is well, I'm gonna do the y direction, because it's not moving in the x direction, and I'm gonna say the acceleration is negative a, because this accelerates that way, uh, and that one accelerates that way. It has the same magnitude, but I know that's gonna accelerate down. Now, it doesn't mean it's gonna move down, right? It could be moving up, but accelerating down, just to be clear. So the forces in the y direction, well, this is gonna be negative m2a, and that's, T minus M2G, that's the Y component of the gravitational force. So now I have two equations, two unknowns. I can solve this pretty easily. Let's take this T and substitute in down here. Negative M2A equals M1A minus M2G. Now I'm gonna add that to both, I'm gonna subtract that to both from both sides. I get negative M2 minus M1, I can factor that out. I can factor out the negative. A equals negative M2G. The negatives cancel. And I'm going to divide both sides by M1 plus M2. So I get A equals M2G over M1 plus M2. Okay, so that shouldn't be too surprising. I mean, this is a mechanics problem, a Newtonian mechanics problem, so nothing super great there. Let's do a couple checks on our solution we should still check. So what are the units? I should have units for as meters per second squared. So that's meters per second squared times kilograms divided by kilograms. The units work. Now, what about this? What if mass one is ginormous? Then, then this tiny little mass wouldn't even make it accelerate. So you should get an acceleration of zero. So with a mass one very large, if I put in a very large value for here, I get some number divided by a very large number, and it goes to zero. So that makes sense. What if mass 2 is giant? If mass 2 is giant, then I get this on the bottom is almost equal to mass 2 on the top. So these two would essentially cancel, and I'd get an acceleration of g. So if this is massive, that mass doesn't even matter, and the acceleration works. So, so that's a double thumbs up. It seems to be working a double thumbs up, and yeah, we get the little sparkle things. That's just an automatic thing because I'm using QuickTime. Okay. Um, 
Now, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, I remember doing this problem as an undergraduate a long time ago, and I made the mistake, and I remember that mistake, it stuck with me. Right here, I said, oh, well, the tension is M2G, that's easy. It's not, right? Because that would be true only if this mass doesn't accelerate. So, just remember that, okay. That's my acceleration, and then I can multiply by uh, M1 to get the tension. So let's just write those over here so we can use them later. Uh, A equals M2G over M1 plus M2, and then the tension was M1, M2G over M1 plus M2. And I'm gonna put a box around that so we don't lose it. Okay, so that was that, we did it. We didn't care about that too much. We really want to do the Lagrangian mechanics. So remember, if I wanted to do Lagrangian here, I would say, how many degrees of freedom do I have? And the answer is one. I only have one degree of freedom, right? It, it, this one moves that way, that one moves the same amount. I could just say, you know, S, the distance from the top, and that's my degree of freedom. And if I did that, I would write my Lagrangian, T minus U, and, <laughs> excuse me, I get the, the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation, let's say that's the distance s. Partial of l with respect to s minus the time derivative of the partial of l with respect to s dot equals zero, and I could get my differential equation from that. Okay, now if I want to find the force of constraint, the force that makes this thing move the way it does, then I need to under-constrain the problem. I need to have too many degrees of freedom. And if I do that, let's do that first, I'm gonna call this x and that y, and then I can come up with uh, an equation of constraint. So my equation of constraint says f of x and y is equal to some constant. So in this case, I can say that x plus y is some constant. The length of the string I'm calling r, I'm not gonna call it l. I hope you see why I'm not gonna call it l. So I'm gonna call it r. That's my equation of constraint. That has to be a constant on that side, and this has to depend on my variables over here. With that, I can write the following two modified Euler-Lagrange equations. The partial of L with respect to X plus lambda, the partial of F with respect to X is the time derivative of the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to X dot. So that looks like the Euler-Lagrange equation if we took that out, it would be the Euler-Lagrange equation. And then I can do it for my other variable lambda, which is our, what we we'll call our Lagrange multiplier, partial of f with respect to y, and the time derivative of the partial of l with respect to y dot. So I get, the, I get a modified Euler-Lagrange equation. Now, at the end of the day, this Lagrange multiplier can depend on time, but I get two forces of constraint. fx is lambda partial of f with respect to x, Fy is la lambda partial of f with respect to y. And those would be my equations of constraint. And that's what I want. Okay, so that's the key thing here. I have this, I have to add in this term in my Euler Lagrange equation, and then I can solve for lambda, and that's what I want to do. I can also solve for the equation of motion. It, it seems weird, and I'm not going to derive where that comes from because it's, it's a lot. Uh, so instead, let's just do it. We already know what the answer is, let's just do it. Okay, let me start back over. I'm gonna write down my Lagrangian. Now, in, that, in this case, it's pretty easy, right? Um, I don't even have to do it in steps. I can say the Lagrangian is 1 half m1 x dot squared plus 1 half m2 y dot squared. So that's my kinetic energy of that mass. It depends on x. My kinetic energy of this mass depends on y. And again, if I was doing Lagrangian, I'd make a relationship between x and y, and this would just, these would combine together. And then the potential energy term is just gonna be uh, this. I'm gonna say that's 
minus m2gy, but since I have minus the potential, I get plus m2gy. So that's my Lagrangian. And I'm calling y down as positive. That's why I had minus, and that's why that's plus. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So let's just apply our first Euler-Lagrange equation that's modified the partial of L with respect to x plus lambda, the partial of f with respect to x equals the time derivative of the partial of L with respect to x dot. It's not too bad, right? The partial of L with respect to x, there's no x, so it's zero. Then I have the partial, let's do this one, the partial of f with respect to x. Uh, well, here's my f is x plus y. So if I take the derivative of this with respect to x, I get 1, 0, 0. So I don't, I, that's a constant. I don't need to worry about that. So I just get 1. And now I need to do this. The partial of L with respect to x dot. I have just one x dot that's right there. I'm going to use the power rule. So bring the 2 down. I have 2 over 2 m1 x dot. Now I need to take the time derivative of that. And so that's just going to be x double dot. So remember, the dot means the derivative with respect to time, double dot, second derivative. But if you've gotten this far, you already knew that. I don't know why I'm telling you that, but that's letting you know. Okay. So if I put that all together, I get 0 plus lambda is m1x double dot. And that's kind of important. Let's put it over here to the side so we can use it later. Uh, it's just lambda equals m1x double dot. Okay. Now we need to do the same thing for y. Oh, I don't even. I don't know why I erased that. I can erase that and that and that and put y's there. Y, y, y dot. So the partial of L with respect to y is not zero because I have that y term over there. I get m two g. The partial of f with respect to y. 1. And then the partial of L with respect to y dot is uh, m2 y dot. And then I take the derivative with respect to time, and I get that. So if I put that all together, I have m2 g plus lambda equals m2 y double dot. Let's just put that up at the top. Uh, I need, I do need this equation. I'm going to rewrite. If I put it up here, I can write it. Yeah. So x plus y equals r. I'm going to need that. And then let's write my equation right there. So then I have that. m2g plus lambda equals m2 y double dot. And then I have that one down there, lambda equals m1 x double dot. So I have three equations and I have three unknowns. One, two, three equation. I don't know lambda. I don't know x double dot. I don't know y double dot. The first thing I, I want to do is to find an expression for, let's say, x double dot. You could do it either way. So up here, I can take the derivative of both sides of that equation and I get x dot plus y dot equals zero. And yeah, I had to check my message. And then I can take the derivative again and I get x, x double dot equals negative y double dot. So now I have a relationship between x dot and y dot and I can put that in up, up here. So let's put that in up here and up here. So if I use these two equations, and I'm going to put lambda in for that, and I'm going to put y double dot in, negative y double dot in for that, and I can get the whole thing. So up here I have m2g, and then lambda is m1x double dot, so it's going to be minus m1y double dot is m2y double dot. And let's solve for y double dot. Add that to both sides. Hopefully you can see what's happening here. I mean, there's no magic happening here. We see where this is going to go, right? 
solving for y double dot, I get m2g over m1 plus m2. Does that look familiar? Oh, it looks like that. Because it is. It's that. So we get the same thing, and that's good. And then also my, my x double dot, if I go up here, it's just the negative of that. It just means it's in the opposite direction, right? Because I call that the positive x direction. It doesn't really matter. But I call this the positive y direction, but again, so it's fine. So that worked. Now let's see if we can get the tension. Okay, so to get the tension, I need to say, um, let's say fx, the force on that one, is lambda, the partial of f, with respect to x. So I need to find lambda. Well, up here I have lambda, lambda. Let's use that lambda right there. Uh, so lambda is going to be m1 times x double dot. And the negative sign kind of matters, doesn't super matter right here because of the direction we're doing. But m1 times this acceleration, m2g over m1 plus m2. So fx is going to be lambda times the partial of f with respect to x. But remember, that was 1, so it's just lambda. So I get technically negative, negative m1, m2, g over m1 plus m2. Did I run out of room? No, I did not. I always feel like when I get over here, I feel like I'm constrained. But that's the same as that. So we did it. We got the tension through Lagrangian mechanics. And again, you may say, oh, whoa, what, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. We did it before with Newtonian, and it was easy. Why are you doing this? Well, let's just think why we would do this. Okay. Um, let's look at another situation that we've seen before. The classic pendulum. So, how do you solve the equation of motion for a pendulum? There are many ways. Uh, you, could, you could use acceleration and polar coordinates. Uh, you could use conservation of energy and centripetal acceleration, which is kind of the same thing. Um, you, you could do a bunch of stuff. Uh, or you could use Lagrangian. Okay. But what if I want to find the tension in the string? So the tension in the string would be a force of constraint. So I could use this method to find that. And again, maybe that's not the simplest method, but maybe it is. Okay, here's another method. Suppose I have uh, some, some path that I know a mathematical function for, and I have a bead sliding down that path. Well, how would I find the force of constraint? Well, this is a one-dimensional problem, right? A one degree of freedom problem. So maybe over here the force is that way, and then it's that way, and it's that way. But I can solve for that force using this method. And it would be very difficult to do that with Newtonian mechanics. Finally, we have this problem that I did before. Uh, ice on a bowl, right? And then the ice slides down, and at some point it leaves the contact of the bowl. Because at some point, if we constrain the ball, the bowl, the ice to be on the bowl, it will start off with a normal force that way, but then there will have to be a normal force this way. And the, the transition between those two, the force goes to zero, that's when it loses contact because the bowl can't actually pull on the ice, so it would, it would lose contact. So we can solve for that, that constraint force as a function of theta and then find out when the constraint force is zero and solve for theta. And I will do that problem. Okay. So there are a lot of situations when you have some generalized coordinates that you don't really relate to Newtonian mechanics so easily, and you want to find the equation of constraint, or the, and you can do that. You can find the force of constraint. You know we're going to do more problems. OK, so again, no Python today. Uh, link down below to the playlist for all these videos so you can follow along and look at stuff. And we'll do some more examples later.